So I was showing you this lettuce the other week, and this is about a few weeks later when it actually starts forming that head right there. You can see it curling up nice in there. I and, see uh, that. You, see you that? had to show. You had to bring some a little bit bigger than what I had last week, didn't you? Well, yes. It's yeah. We kind of have to have a little competition every now and then. And what, my point was here is that these things, especially during the cooler months, have an excellent what we call field holding ability. So mm -hmm. these have been sitting out there. We've been harvesting these uh, for three or four weeks now. And you got to worry about them bolting, and they'll just get bigger, and the heads get a little denser. But you can harvest them smaller or let them get big like this. My skyfos has actually made a head up and ate me a mess of them last night. Skyfos? Big old salad out of Yeah, you. I got some skyfos starting to head up too pretty good, but um, that that's where it gets good. These things get huge, you yep. can see here. And that is the butter crunch. That is the butter crunch. And uh, we've got a new variety on the site that is a but green butter head. It's a hybrid variety called Harmony that's pelleted. That's got some improved characteristics to it that uh, I'm trying out too. Hmm, good deal. What about this big old fine watermelon radish I grew? Look at there, folks. Oh, that's pretty. That's pretty. Mm -hmm. Well, let's say hey to everybody before we Hello. get in there. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Row by Row Garden Show. I'm Travis. I'm Greg. And we're excited to have you with us tonight. We've got some good stuff planned. We're going to talk about planting tomatoes tonight and uh but before we do that let's take a look at what you got there it's one of the biggest radishes i've ever grown this year these are watermelon radishes ain't that just dead gun beautiful that's it's pretty big as a turnip root the fella yeah. didn't know nobody he'd think that's a turnip root but that is a big old radish so let's have a milder flavor than uh yep regular radish i cut these up last night and put them on my salad as well some folks call it a red, some folks call it a red meat radish, mm -hmm. but uh, we call it a watermelon radish. Watermelon radish. That's pretty good, ain't it? That's good. It doesn't really taste like watermelon, but it looks like watermelon. Looks like watermelon. Now these take a little longer to mature. These are around 50 days where moisture radish is around 30 days. Yeah. But you do let these get a little bigger. And they don't seem to crack as bad to me. They won't. They won't crack as bad. Um, you could probably eat the leaves there like yeah. you do turnips. That's pretty right there. Yep. That's hard to beat there. All right. And um, you drop it. I drop some. It's okay. As far as what we got going on in the garden, we had a lot of rain last weekend. But man, it's warming up outside. It is, and uh, my cover crops is paying off. Uh, my mustard greens got time for me to, to, to work them into the soil, so I got them worked in, and that's where I'm gonna plant my potatoes at. So I'm just about ready for a potato plant time. Some of my other crops are, has got to the point I need to cut them in, so I've cut them down. I still got time here in the south where we're at to plant another cover crop if I wanted to, but I'm going to kind of wait and see where I'm at there. You could, if you're planting a late spring crop, go ahead and get you another cool season cover crop in now between now and then, but well, I'm going to wait and see how that, uh, mm -hmm. how that rolls. And we're supposed to hit 80 degrees uh, the next day or two, which is nice. Nice and warm outside. Probably going to be starting peppers and tomatoes pretty soon in the greenhouse. Yep. Um, we've got lettuce, some other stuff going in there right now that, that we can still squeeze in the window. I'm um, going to plant me a, some tiger collars today. Tiger collars today. As far as looking back on this winter, because we ain't done with it yet, we're still going to get a couple strikes of cool in February. But it ain't been near as bad a winter as we had last mm. year. Nope, not near as bad. Uh, now, the folks up north have had it rough. I got some friends in Ohio, and I got a friend in, in Wisconsin the other day that got hit with that bad storm up there. But they have had a hard spring up north. I mean, a hard winter up north. Yeah, there's several days up there I talked to some folks. They didn't get above zero. Yep. I don't know. No talked to Noel the other day. Noel owns Copperhead, if y'all familiar with a little hand tool Copperhead. And the day I talked to him that morning, he said it was 30 below. Now, that's not wind chill. That was degrees. 30 below. Mm. He said his little old dog, he has to watch him when he goes outside to use the bathroom because if he stayed out very long, he'd froze solid. He had to mm. get him back in. I ain't never been nowhere that cold. I haven't either. I don't, I don't need to be. That was in Wisconsin. That's way up there. That's that's cold. Um, 
I wanted to show folks some sneak peek of some stuff. This yeah. rascal right here. So we talked about this on a previous show, and this is kind of the final prototype here. <coughs> Excuse me. This is our handheld oscillating hoe that we got here. And we've tested this baby out and it is a bruiser. And the reason we decided to make one of these is we in the past have tried out several that we thought about carrying. There was one from, I want to say England that we looked at. Switzerland. Switzerland. And we just weren't real happy with the quality and the consistency of the design. So we took it upon ourselves to design our own here. Now this is fairly similar design to the one that attaches on our wheel hoe. The one that attaches on the wheel hoe won't work on a handle because it's a little too heavy. So we took the steel and went from what, a quarter inch to, to three sixteenths. To three sixteenths, give you a little, you know, make it a little more lighter there so it's easier to maneuver around. And then this is kind of, you won't find one that has this design right here with the, the square pegged handle. And uh, that ain't going nowhere, folks. And we have the blades that'll be replaceable. So um, we're going to get these into production soon. Now, this is raw. I mean, the ones we have in production will be, will be green. They'll be yeah, they'll painted. be powder coated green. Um, but you'll be you'll have the ability to change the blade on them and we tried this one out here and it it we're really really pleased with uh, that that's spring steel that's 1095 high carbon steel fellow wear one of them blades out there i need i need to have uh, lunch with him because he's a pretty bad dude so but it is replaceable but it, it's going to take a lot of wear and tear to get to wear one of them out and it, it rotates back and forth 20 degrees just like our other one does and uh, from our experiences and what we've tried out there with these handheld handheld stirrup hose this is going to be definitely the best one on the market you'll find there and as always made in the usa there you go so um and what's what length handle we're going to have on 60 inch handle so nice long handle on there and it's not going to be lacquer it's going to be wax finished so you ain't got to worry about it splintering up messing up your hand that's right so uh Stay tuned for that. We hope to get those rolling out pretty soon. And on today's show, our main topic, we're going to talk about tomatoes. Now, we do some, um, some surveys throughout the year asking people kind of what their favorite crops to grow in the vegetable garden. And uh, corn and tomatoes are probably the two most popular things that our customers grow in the well, vegetable garden. I'm the garden. same way. They don't nobody love a good tomato sandwich no more than what I do. And... Uh, now we're getting time, it's getting close to time to start tomatoes in the greenhouse. Um, usually around February or so, we get them February going. the 15th is normally my time to start them. Now we probably might need to start peppers a little bit before then, but we could get by with probably starting the 15th is when I like to start my tomatoes. Mm -hmm. And we like to do ours so we can plant them, trying to gauge the time, which is different every year because it gets warmer sooner every year, but try to gauge it so we can plant them straight out of our seed starting trays and we don't have to step them up in the bigger pots. Yeah. Some people do. Your grandmother, for one, likes to step hers up in big old pots. Each to their own, but I've told her several times I thought she was wasting some good pot and soil that way. Well, some people think the bigger the plant they put in the ground, the more productive or more tomatoes they're going to get, which ain't true. This is it's the opposite. Right. So you put that small one in there out of that seed starting tray, it's going to do just you as good. You want to plant that fresh, good plant that's got plenty of vigor left in it in the ground and get it going, and it'll outgrow that one that's this, this been in a pot for a and while. And you're going to get less transplant yeah. shock, too. Uh, before we get into some tips and tricks on growing tomatoes and strategies there, let's talk about varieties real quick. So we've got, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, you got your heirloom and your open pollinated varieties and then you've got your hybrid varieties now where we are we have a tough time growing the heirlooms not to say we don't plant a couple every year have a tough time now in town about 15 miles up the road i got friends that can grow the heirlooms i do too good where we are with huge cotton fields and cabbage fields a lot of commercial agriculture right on us right here it can be a little tough Yep. So, you know, grow what you want to grow where you can grow it. That's what we have to do. We have to grow some of the virus resistant hybrids out here on our place, with the exception of one we'll talk about in a minute. There's one out there that's an, uh, that is an old, older variety, OP variety that we can grow. Okay. 
Well, let's go through some of these OP varieties first, and then we'll talk about the hybrids. How about that? Yep. Let me... Uh... The first one here, we'll talk about, let me have go a ahead. Space here, is this Amish paste. And this is a variety been around forever, and it's a Roma style variety. And it's really good for making salsa or any kind of stews, anything like that you want to put up. And it's a, it's a go-to variety a lot of people love for that. So try. I'm probably going to try some of these Amish paste this year and just see what kind of disease resistance they have got. Oh, Danny at Deep South Homestead, if you've never seen their channel, check them out. Uh, they grow those a lot and really like them. They use them for canning and putting up. Yep. Um, the other OP variety, or the next one we've got, is the Cherokee Purple here, which is a real popular one. Makes a beautiful little tomato. The ones I've seen, and I don't know if it's just how they were grown, don't get real big, but they nice size tomatoes. Uh, I've seen some pretty good size ones. Okay. And that's an intermediate uh, tomato. Indeterminate. Indeterminate. Yeah. Indeterminate. indeterminate tomato. Yeah, this is indeterminate as well. All these first ones we're going to talk about are indeterminate tomatoes, which means that they will, vines will grow up and they'll continue to make all during the season if you take care of that vine. Right. So we've got the Cherokee Purple, which has a nice little dark color to it. Real pretty. Now this one is a little new to me. But I've heard really good things about it, and I'm excited about trying it. It's called the Jubilee. And this was actually one of the AAS All-American Selections winner. and makes a nice, big, pretty yellow tomato there. It's supposed to have really good flavor. And usually with the yellow, if it's got any yellow or orange in it, it gives it kind of a little citrusy flavor. Mm -hmm. And then we've got the Mortgage Lifter here. Which is considered a beefsteak variety. Right. Do you know how this got its name? Yes, I do. Go ahead and tell us. There was a fellow years ago that was about to lose this place. Uh huh. And he bred up these tomatoes and grew them. And in six years' time, he paid off his note, his mortgage, with these tomatoes right here by selling them. And that's the reason they got named Mortgage Lifter. That's right. From what I read, and this was 40, 50 years ago, he was selling these things for a dollar a pound, which was a lot of money back in them mm -hmm. days. So uh, the Mortgage Lifter there, nice big old beefsteak tomato. Then we've got. Now this one here will grow that's and one grow I was, and yeah, grow yeah. and grow. So that's the one I was going to tell you about that we can grow that seems to have this OP variety, but it does seem to have some disease resistance to it. I can grow these in my garden. And they will grow and grow and grow. Now here's the thing. you got to grow a, you a couple of these right here, but you don't need but a couple unless you've got a, a school full of youngins at your house. Because these things will make and make and make. Two of them, two plants is sufficient for the average household. But what you do is you buy you a pack of these seeds and you grow these plants out. And these makes wonderful gifts to your friends that want to grow some tomatoes. Because anybody can grow these tomatoes here. They're fabulous for patio and container garden. Yeah. So you give need it to you a good trellis system. We'll talk about yep. that in a minute. But these things are very prolific. Yeah, give out to that person that has trouble growing tomatoes and they can grow that one and they'll really enjoy it. And then the last one here of the OP varieties we got is the Brandywine Pink, and we grew this one last mm, year. I like that one. Really pretty beef steak that made a really good flavor to it. Uh, it's got that kind of heirloom, uh, lobed appearance to it. Really nice variety there. Now, with too. the exception of that yellow pear, you're not going to get a huge bounty off in plants because one thing with those heirlooms is they don't make as much as some of these some of these hybrids and stuff. So you got to settle a little bit with productivity not quite being there but your taste and your flavor and everything's going to make up with that so just understand that don't be disappointed if they don't load up because that's just not nature of the plant yeah if you want to grow if you want to put up some tomato sauce or something like that use the hybrid varieties for that use those heirloom indeterminates for growing you know the, the pretty ones for your tomato sandwiches whatever so let's get into the hybrids and we've got uh Let's, let's do this one first, this cherry one here. So we grew this one last year. And this is probably, it's a smaller one, like a cherry tomato size called Sun Gold. And this is probably one of the best tasting tomatoes out there to me. These things are absolutely delicious. Now it shows more of a red one on there, but I thought they got more of a yellow color. Too. Well, this, this kind of shows the progression okay. of them. So they start out green, yellow, get kind of orange. If you leave them on there long enough, they'll, they'll get kind of orangish red. You kind of, I like to pick them at kind of that orange stage mm -hmm. there. These sun golds are really prolific too. Uh, they're indeterminate. They do have a little bit of disease resistance there. 
and uh, we really like the Sun Gold. Now on to the bigger hybrid tomatoes, and we've got three here, and these are all pelleted. If you've ever put your tomato seeds in the seed trays, you know them tiny seeds there, it, it takes some good eyesight and some good precision there. So the pelleted seeds make it a lot easier to singulate and get one per hole. So the first one we've got is the Bella Rosa, which we've grown for years and years, and, and has always been a good producer for us. It's my standby. I did a, a trial a few years ago with several different hybrid varieties, and that one came out on top for me. So that's been my standby right there. So the Bella Rosa, and then we've got the Mountain Glory here. Which is, these Mountain Series was developed by a guy named Randy up in North Carolina, North Carolina State, I believe. And it's a mountain series of hybrid tomatoes that have very good disease resistance, but they maintain the flavor. So the mountain series is another good one to try. Uh, flavor profile there up there at the top. Yeah, so mountain's glory there. And then the last one here, which is the most comprehensive disease package we've seen in a hybrid tomato is this brickyard here. Yeah, and I'm not growing these. I'm gonna grow me a couple this year to check them out. But it, it's on top of the chart for disease resistance. Yeah, so these come highly recommended. So what I'm going to do this year is I'm going to actually grow all three and uh, check them out side by side there. I expect them all to perform well, but, uh, but I like, just like to see what the differences are between well, the Well, what I like to see is, is how the, the, the any taste difference in them. Right, right. Now, last year we compared the Bella Rosa to the brandy wine and couldn't really tell a big taste difference. So the, the common misconception out there is that the hybrids don't have as good a taste. But uh, from What happened back in the 80s when a lot of these uh, tomato breeding programs started for the commercial farmers is they bred some great varieties that have good shelf life and had good disease resistance. So they tasted like cardboard. Mm -hmm. So on into the like two- store -bought Like tomato. your store-bought tomatoes. So on in, uh, later in the 2000s and on up, they took, they took a different approach to these breeding programs that they wanted flavor profiles. And that's where we come up with some of these new varieties like the Bella Roses and these Mountain Series that, that have the package of good disease resistance, but yet have these great flavor profiles, which is kind of, that's good. Yeah, yeah. So they, they kind of backed up a little yep. bit. And hey, some of them that they bred and grew back there in the 80s and stuff, I can remember one particular variety called 908. It would not rot. Yeah. It would not. You could buy them things and they'd get just as blood red as they could be. They'd stay there for weeks. Huh. Now, it was just like eating cardboard. I mean, it wasn't worth a toot to eat, but it was it pretty. pretty. It was pretty. And, and the grocery stores could buy them. They loved them because they didn't have any throwaway. They lasted forever. And they, you don't get to taste them at the grocery store. Mm -mm. So but that variety's been going for a long time, but it was a 908. I don't ever forget it. 908 variety. Huh. It's a 908. Stay away from the 908. Mm. All right. So. Um, we went over our varieties there, got a lot of different selections for you to try you some of the hybrids for your productivity and then try you some of the heirlooms there to get kind of those specialty mm -hmm. tomatoes. Um, you can buy tomato plants at your local hardware store and your local big box store already done up for you. But in my experiences, because I'll buy one every now and then just to see, they perform much more poorly than the ones we grow ourselves. And if you buy some of the disease resistant ones out there, the one of the varieties that they really pump a lot is one called Amelia, mm -hmm. which was one of the first varieties around in our area that had the tomato spotted whip virus resistance to it. Mm -hmm. And that's a variety a lot of people grow, and that's a lot of the ones you see at your big box stores. They don't have a good flavor profile to me. I don't like the taste of them. Yeah, hand me a seed tray. You got one around there? Yeah. Um, so the best thing from our experiences is to grow your own because you can, you can pick what varieties you want. You're not at the mercy of the stores. And also a lot of times in the stores, you can't tell how long that plant's been there, if it's root bound or whatever. So growing them in your own trays, like these seed starting trays. And if you don't need 162 tomatoes, grow some for you, you know, go in with your neighbor there or you can put some peppers in there. Yeah. Or what a fella can do is he can go ahead and grow 162 tomatoes and then sell half of them to his neighbor and you come out and then pay for your seed tray and your mater seed and everything yep. else. So um, we plant directly out of these. We mm -hmm. don't step them up. 
Uh, unless we were to get a real late cold spell, we couldn't get them in the ground. But we plant them directly out of these. When they're ready to go on the ground, we usually set these outside the greenhouse for a week or two, let them harden off, and they're good to go. Yeah, I probably got seven or eight people I grew tomato plants for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, you mighty uh, chivalrous with your mm -hmm. tomato plant growing. I love to grow tomato plants. That's one of my favorite things to do. That and growing corn. Yeah. Um, so growing your own plants is big. That's going to be a, a big key to having a successful tomato crop. As far as irrigation goes, with tomatoes, boy, drip is more important with tomatoes than, than almost any other crop. You gotta have drip on tomatoes if you're gonna be successful with it. it. Takes that leaf moisture off the leaf, it puts the water right at the root system there. It's gonna help with disease, it's gonna help with blossom end rot, it's gonna help all the way around. Yeah, so using drip on tomatoes, and our drip tape has 12 inch emitter spacing. And but we plant our tomatoes on two foot spacing, so every other emitter set a plant on top of it, and you're good to go. Let's talk about trellising tomatoes. So keeping those plants off the ground is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with these varieties like these yellow pears and things like that, these things can get huge. That's right. So you need a we need a big trellis or a big cage or something like that to keep them contained because they get wily on you. You can't grow that yellow pear without some type of support. That's right. Uh, for the indeterminate varieties, <coughs> excuse me, for the indeterminate varieties, we recommend using the cages. And uh, you can do this one time if you want to, but I'll go ahead and tell you to save you the error. Those little cone shaped ones that you buy at the big box stores, they ain't going to hold up. No, sir. no yellow pear tomato. No, sir. They'll fall over in no time. So you need to look at ours and get that long, tall one. It's a little bit expensive, but it's well made, made in USA, and it's a square one. And you can fold it up when you get through with it, but it has the wherewithal to hold up that yellow pear. Now the yellow pears and these indeterminate tomatoes are going to continue to make throughout the season, so they're going to be there for you for a while. These determinate tomatoes. If you read the book on there, it says the difference between the determinant and the indeterminate is the determinant makes one crop. Well, mm -hmm. that's kind of sort of true. But they're going to they're gonna fruit and they're going to make and then they're over with. Now, you normally on a determinant bush, you have what I consider three crops. You got your bottom crop first, you got your middle crop, and you got your top crop. And these just step right on. When you, once you get to that top crop, it's just about over with. Mm -hmm. you can, cut them down and go on. The bottom crop normally is a little more susceptible to blossom in right because it's your first ones to come on. Mm -hmm. So these are really not your best crop. Your middle crop is the best. Mm -hmm. And then your top crop, your size gets a little smaller on those. But it's just like moonshine, that bottom, that middle in there is the best. It's always the best right there. Not the top, not the bottom, but the middle there. That's where you get your best tomatoes and your most productive uh, bunching off of. Yeah. I've I've seen that as well. With the determinate ones, we like to use the Florida weed trellis and show them the. Um... So we've got two types of twine for the trellis and the Florida weed trellis. We got several different videos out there on that. It's really easy to do. All you need is some T posts, some wooden stakes, and some twine, and it's it's pretty easy to rig. And we've got two types of twine. We've got the cotton twine, which comes in the smaller rolls. So if you just got a few plants, or if you got a whole big old row of tomatoes, this stuff right here, and you can uh, you put this on your belt loop there. There's over a mile of twine in here, so this box will last you a while. But you put that on your belt loop, and you can run through there and string them up in no time. Yep. So that's we use this for the determinants, and then the cages for the indeterminants. Um, you mentioned blossom end rot earlier. Yeah, what can we do about that? Blossom end rot is a common thing most people have trouble with. And I have too, but I have found pretty much the solution to that is threefold. Is that three? One, two, three. Drip irrigation. Uh-huh. A calcium layer. You uh -huh. need to use a lamp plaster or a pelletized gypsum. And the third is a good compost. So if you got good compost that you put pre-plant pre out there, then you put your calcium, which is your gypsum or land plaster, you put it at bloom set, and then you got drip irrigation. I'm not going to tell you you're not going to have some blossom in rot, but you can dramatically reduce it. Yeah, and it will go away. You might have it on the first couple of fruits, but if you get that calcium to the plant, 
it'll go away and your middle fruit set will be nice and ideal for you. So adding that gypsum, some places say added it first bloom set. I've been known to add it when I plant the plants in the ground. Well, calcium is extremely soluble, so I like to do mine probably, if, I, if I'm watching pretty close, I like to do it a week or two before the first bloom set is my ideal time to do it. Either way, get that calcium there and it... Uh, now, compost, compost has calcium available in it. And my theory behind the thing is to put the compost down at plant time, pre-plant. Okay. And then use your calcium there right before bloom set, and then you got a steady supply running through there. That makes sense. That's a good, good tip there. All right. Let's talk about pests and diseases real quick before we get into our questions. Um, the ones I deal with the most, I had them bad last year. Of course, it got to the end of the determinant crop was these leaf-footed bugs, which are kind of related to squash bugs. And with any kind of these flying insects like this, you got to be kind of precautionary with it. Proactive. Proactive. And start early with them. Once you get that full-blown adult population, there ain't really anything you can do. Yep. Start early. Keep your neem oil. Keep pyrethrin, spinosad. Hit them tomatoes pretty early on. And in addition to that, while you're hitting those things early on that, put you something in there for blight. Some, some copper products and things like that because tomatoes are susceptible to blight. So, so spray some things like that to help with your blight problem. Early blight and late blight. Another thing with blight is make sure you do your rotation. Don't never plant tomatoes and potatoes in the same spot. Right. Always rotate them around. That'll help with your blight. But even if you do that, sometimes you can have some of that early. I have a little bit of problem with early blight in my tomatoes, so I try to rotate, cover crops, all those things that we talk about, and plus keep them sprayed with some of those copper products early on seems to help with the blight. And, and some people have problems with the tomato hornworms. I don't really have an issue with those. I don't either. Uh, usually some, some BT mixed in with your spray uh, eliminate those yeah, guys Yeah, I don't have a easily. lot of problem with those. As far as diseases, we have the uh, tomato spotted wilt virus, which is the big one right here that's spread by thrips. Mm -hmm. um, we, you also can get the cucumber mosaic virus, which is spread by aphids. Um, and that's why we had to have them disease resistant varieties. Yeah, I have more trouble with thrips and aphids here in our location than I do the hornworms and stuff. So I start seeing my leaves getting a little crinkly, cupping, not, not cupping up a little bit, and I know I got some problems. Those sucking insects seems to hit me first. Mm -hmm. And when I, I have to start treating for those, and that may be one reason I don't have a, a worm problem because I start treating early for those and it takes care of my worm problem. All right. So. If you have any more questions about tomatoes, any uh, particular specific questions we didn't cover, put those in the comments, and as always, we'll be glad to answer them on next week's show. Let's get into a couple questions from last week, and if we answer your question on the show, send us an email to cussserve at hostools.com with your address, and we'll send you a nice little prize out there. Okay, so Mr. Mike Henderson wrote, I received notification yesterday that my seed taters were on the way. I ordered some Yukon Gold from you guys. Now the million dollar question. I was planning on planting them on the 14th or 15th to take advantage of the full moon. Do you think the moon stage has anything to do with it? I've heard this all my life. Fat or wise tale. Well, let me tell Easy you. now, you're gonna get in trouble <laughs> for this. Let me tell you something, folks. Them taters is gonna grow with or without the moon. If something come along and, and we had an asteroid destroy the moon, your taters would still grow. Now that's pretty, that's pretty stout there. We got to have a moon. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I, I think the taters will grow. Uh, yeah, I don't know. The, they don't limit. We're in a huge agriculture area here. Huge agriculture. And nobody plants on the moon. No. It's an old wives. And you, we, I hear older people around here talking about it. But plant your taters when you can get out there and plant them. Don't wait on no moon to plant your taters. Because if you do, especially if you plant some of these late varieties, you're liable not to get them in in time. So plant your taters when you can plant them. Don't wait on the moon. I can promise you I ain't never paid attention to the moon when I'm planting anything, and it has never mattered. Yep, I agree. And plus, the theory behind the moon planting is that the gravitational pull is pulling up moisture. When you plant potatoes, they don't need any moisture. They're working off what's in that uh Most times it's the other way around. You're waiting for your ground dry enough to get in. Right, so, so that doesn't really hold any light there. 
All right, so hopefully I didn't make anybody too mad at Plants by the Moon. I don't know worry about you doing away with the moon there with the Astro. Would I have a little upset? <laughs> <laughs> Not really. I was just <laughs> hypothetically speaking. Um, our second question comes from Jonathan Doherty, and he says, His granddaddy used to use ammonium nitrate in his garden when he was a youngin'. Uh, we, he's heard us talk about Chilean nitrate. wants to know what's the difference other than the nitrogen percentage. Yeah, I bet he could ask his granddaddy about some bulldog sodium. His granddaddy knew about that too. The main two differences is, is one of them is synthetic and one of them is not. The Chilean nitrate or nitrate of soda is a natural product that is omni-certified. For you that don't know that, it is allowed in organic production. It's mined in Chile. It's mined in Chile and it's an organic compound that's just took right out of the ground and bagged. And you can use this product and, and it can be considered organic. Now, ammonia nitrate is a synthetic product that's made from nitric acid through a, a man-made process there. They both have very common attributes to them. Now, as far as me to sit very here... what attributes? Common. Oh, very common attributes. Yeah, what, like I said, <laughs> anyway, they work the same way. Now, now the ammonia nitrate is a lot more powerful, so it's more, a lot more apt to burn than the, uh, than the Chilean nitrate. Both of them work pretty much the same. Um, so one of them synthetic and one of them is not. It's not a whole lot of difference in there. I would be, I, w I think it's a fine way to supplement your nitrogen with ammonia nitrate, just like it is with Chilean nitrate. Do not use either one of them for your all your total nitrogen. So there use you go. Use some compost too. Yeah, use Maybe some compost, some use, use some balanced fertilizer. If you got a nitrogen level plant and you need to hit it with just some nitrogen, Either one of those work fine. If you're concerned about being organic or natural, use the Chilean. If it really doesn't matter to you, use the ammonia nitrate. Okay. Good tips there. Before we sign off, did you want to... Uh... Now, I'm going to talk a little bit to people about Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day is coming up. Okay, go ahead. And uh, if you boys out there are struggling with what to get your wife for Valentine's Day, as we all do, yeah, it's tough. buy her a bag of seed taters. We got 10 pound bag seed taters, and I'm tell you what, she'd love to have some of those, and she won't never forget it. For long as you and her are together, she'll always say, you remember that year you bought me seed taters for my Valentine's Day? Mm -hmm. Well, it's coming time. It's time to plant seed taters, and this is a useful, great product that I think would just make her heart, just, I think it'd do good for her. I think she would love that. Yeah, just imagine kind of setting the scene here, you get up a little earlier than she does that morning. Uh, she walks in there. You got breakfast made. And on the table there, you got a nice little bag of seed taters and a card sitting oh, on man. it. Oh, man. Happy Valentine's Ooh. Day. I mean, just brownie points for the Like whole I said, year. she won't never forget it, and you won't either. So um, keep that in mind, boys. Keep that in mind. We got four different varieties there. Good to go around. Make your wife happy with some seed taters this yep. year. All right. Well, that's going to do it for today's show. We hope you enjoyed it, and we will see you guys next week. Take care.